Hey, brother. Hey. How's it going? What's up? No, going good. Going good. Yeah, man. Look at you. Yours is massive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, you know, I, it's, um, it's something. It's been a work in progress. I keep trying to trim it, and then I screwed up, and then I got to do it again, and then I, I try to grow it, and then it looks horrible. And then I'm trying to, <laughs> you know, what I, mean? I never thought, I never thought I'd see the day where I'd be one of those beard grooming type people, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. But it happens, man. Yeah. So, but my, it, it, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, my my wife hates it. This is just my COVID thing. I don't yeah. plan, I don't plan on keeping it. I don't really think I can grow one proper, man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like it's got, Yeah. <laughs> yeah, mine's all weird. It's like it all it's it only grows on the bot like it's Yeah. But yeah. whatever. Yeah. My but my kid you know what happened like a month you ago. You don't have like, a lot I, of whites I, though. You don't have a lot of whites. So there's just do you use like little tools <laughs> to cover them. <laughs> no. But uh I tried trimming it, and then my daughter freaked out, and she was like, "No, I like it better when you have the the beard." So I'm like, "All right, I gotta keep it now." So it is uh, what it is. They win every time. <clears throat> That's it. That's it. How you doing? Time. Everything good on your end? Yeah, I mean, it is what it is. Wow. Trying to trying to hang in there. I'm not sure how long this is gonna last, but it's definitely affecting you know my whole my academy, my business, and. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of the way things are panning out and the approaches to that, that that people are going to like the Zoom classes and all that. Like I'm doing that too because it's have to. it's important to stay connected with uh, with the students yeah. and <clears throat> and to keep those relationships going. But I just don't think you know the nature of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Like it's 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 not the same. It's just not the same. You know. Yeah, it's that's it's the touch, it's the sensitivity. I don't know what Hickson used to say. It's that yeah. sense of touch that separates jujitsu from from everything else. Yeah. But at the end of the day, this is a this is a big scar on the world. It's not the end of the world, like some people are saying, but it's a scar, you know. Oh, and yeah. I think like I think you you're doing the good thing, you know. You're keeping your social media out there, you're creating content all the time. Yeah, and you 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 kind of like I'm not a business owner as far as a gym owner is concerned. But I, I'm I'm in the content world of jujitsu, and I know a lot of gym owners from all over the world. Mm -hmm. And the guys that are winning are the ones that are keeping connected with the students. And I think that that's what you're doing a great job of. It's the guys that are just sitting back and and not doing shit. And then they think when this is over, you know, everyone's you know they have this expectancy where everyone's got to come join them after. They're gonna lose. They're gonna lose students mm -hmm. to the first guys that open up the open mats. The first guys that start soliciting students just because you weren't staying connected with them. So yeah. what you're doing is a good thing, you know. Even though it's not what we want to be the normal, we have to accept that there's going to be a new normal yeah. and a weird normal. And then maybe down, you know, six months down the road, maybe we'll get to the normals back again. But yeah. I'm uh, hoping sooner through. than that. <laughs> I'm hoping so yeah. that, you know. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's open. It's starting, man. Like uh, Bruno Frazato in Atlanta, he, he has kids' classes running now. And, and, you know, they have, like, little sections. And yeah, the yeah, kids are yeah. just doing drills. But I look at it this way. Like, if, like, okay, the competitors in your academy, they, they understand the importance of drilling, okay? The average student that wants to take their training to the next level, they probably don't see the value as much as the competitor. But what's going to happen is if that's their only thing they could do because they all want to spar when they go to normal <laughs> class. But now if that's all they can do, they're going to do the best they can. And then when it's time to come back, they may actually see strides in their game that they never mm -hmm. saw before. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I just, you never know. We get, yeah. You know, it's got to take, take a blessing. I got to take a good with the bad out of this. That's yeah. all I'm saying. Well, I mean, it's for me. It's the, I don't think people realize the the amount of work that is required oh. to do those those formats, like six feet apart solo drills, smaller classes. You have to clean everything afterwards. There's so oh. many like steps, and it's a lot of work and effort, man. You know what I mean? So yeah. you you definitely need a certain amount of uh, uh, students to come back in order to justify all that work. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I mean, and yeah, in sure. right now where we are, like the situation in Canada, there's like 
there we're lumped into a category where like we can't open until phase three man that could be months from now right so i know that there's yeah. some um some people in the community trying to push for us to at least for them to consider for martial arts academies to open sooner but i mean i don't know where that stands i know there's a lot of effort being made but at the end of the day it's what the government wants right so that's where yeah. it's a little bit tricky because you know we have you know, lease agreements and payments and man if this if we can't run any classes at all of any format until like september october november man a lot of academies are going to start to to, yeah, to feel sure. that pressure you know so the, yeah. the, the the hardest part right now is I think all of us are taking steps towards doing the as as much as we can, as best as we can. But ultimately, we're just sitting back and waiting and hoping that the government will do something about it. You know, a little yeah. so, sooner, hopefully sooner rather than later. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it, yeah. it's it's tough for a lot of us who have our academy owners, um, especially uh -huh. one that's like we're fully invested. It's not a part time thing; it's a full time thing. So. It's it's yeah. a, it's a struggle, but there's there's nothing we can do. Like we're in this situation, and you either take steps to do something or you, you do nothing, right? So yeah. it's a well, it's a juggling know, I, act. I I think the the one benefit that we have is in jujitsu, wherever academy it is, is that the students that are there, yeah, they're there to learn technique, they're there to train, they're there to to better themselves as far as the competition aspect or the martial art. But a lot of people like they enjoy the atmosphere. They enjoy hanging out. They enjoy talking yeah, yeah. to the to the people. Yeah. They enjoy the family aspect. They enjoy the friends that they've made. They enjoy that time just as much, maybe sometimes if not better than the the physical training or the the other aspects of it. So I think if we could bring that back, but to some regard re degree, yeah. Yeah. then you know we're we're stepping towards you know, the icing on the cake down the road, which will be the sparring and, and all the other stuff. So I think if yeah. we, you know, the first step, in my opinion, is, like I said, connecting with your students on a daily or yeah. weekly basis, um, you know, not just through email, but like the Zoom classes or even just have like, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who, whose gray beard is coming in nicely? That's the question. Somebody just said your gray <laughs> beard's coming. I don't know if that was yours or I think it's yours, brother. I Mine's... <laughs> Or maybe that's why I put the red shirt so you can't see the gray because it contrasts red and red. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but anyways, like I was saying, you know, like you you keep the connection and then and then you know yeah. you, you bring back that, that atmosphere back as far as like hanging out at the academy and even if it's a couple feet apart, you're still hanging out, you're having yeah. fun, you're socializing. Imagine how much people are going to value that social time and hanging out mm -hmm. and just being able to come in the door and being able to, to, to say they're there again, as opposed to just getting in and training and getting out. So right. I, I, I'm, I'm interested to see how the new normal looks. And uh, of course I want to train just like everyone else, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. I mean, it's just, I'm just like taking my time preparing uh, keeping an yep. eye on the, keeping an eye on the industry, the business side of it, and just kind of sure. accumulating as much information as I can, and then just now I'm I'm prepared to do whatever whatever steps. Like I I met with my business partner, and we have like okay, short term, long term. What do how do we address it? We're not just yeah. sitting back and going oh whatever. No, we're we're you know weekly we talk and we're like okay, and then we have a plan. Okay, we made a plan. Okay. What do we do after these two months? Let's see where we are. Okay, what's going to do in the next two months? Or well, what happens worst case scenario? We have to close. Like we, everything is planned out ahead of time. That way, nice. you know, we were not just again. Right now, we're just waiting to see what the government decides. But whatever they decide, we're prepared for. Like, we got a plan. We can't just like, yeah. say oh forget it and that's it. No, I'm no. not man. It's yeah, ten. Can't. It's ten years of my life. I'm not you know. Yeah. I mean, as far as this has been my full time. Um, you know, uh, endeavor for the last 10 years. So I'm not willing yeah. to just give that up just yet. <laughs> not willing well, to give up the you've, fight. <laughs> so listen, you've done a great job, uh, you know, in, in, in doing martial arts as a, as a competitor and now as a professor, as a team builder. So I think if you take that sort of same focus and drive that you used towards all those aspects into 
you know, business in this new normal that's going to be, I think you're going to be successful, man, because you know, my hat's off to you. You've done a great job building, you know, your Thank team, you. your academy, you. You, you're, you're grinding, you know what I mean? Like you're out there, you're not in a, you're not in an easy market. You're in Toronto. It's not like you're in freaking yeah. Beamsville or something. You know what I mean? Like you're in, you're in a very competitive market, yeah. a high price market. And uh, that just shows how much of a warrior you are because you're willing to take it on, you know, head those first and, and, you know, you'll do the same thing with this. So just keep going, brother. Just keep doing yeah. what you're doing. You're Thanks, doing a good man. job. I appreciate it. Um, no, man, listen, that goes the same, same goes for you, man. Like I've seen, you know, we go way back, you know, from the early days of BJJ in, in Ontario and Canada. Yeah. And I've seen like what you've, where you started and where you are now. And you've accomplished some really cool things as far as like where you placed yourself in the industry, in the BJJ industry and, how you are now a, a personality that people respect because of your knowledge base and, and what you've, what you bring to the table as a commentator and man, you're doing a good job, man. You, you've, I remember you started off promoting tournaments and, and those special events back in the day, those were pretty awesome too. So you've always yeah. been a big um, uh, promoter of our art and, and uh, I'm proud of you, man. Good job. Thanks buddy. Thanks, man. It's, it's been, like you said too, it's been a long journey. And I think for me, it's like, I'm sure just like anyone in jujitsu is like jujitsu kind of saved me in a lot of ways. So I always felt that like if jujitsu did so much for me in my personal life and my life and my existence, I need to pay it forward. So how do I pay it forward? I mean, I decided a long time ago where I'm going to be freaking Mr. Jiu-Jitsu. I'm going to try to build it. I'm going to try to promote it. If I see something cool in Jiu-Jitsu, I want to be in. I want to be involved. I want to, if I'm, like, you know, uh, yeah, I commentate and do all this stuff, like, all over the world. But, like, a lot of people don't see, you know, the hard work that guys like you and myself would put in. You know, they see the result or what they perceive to be the result, but they don't see the work, you know. Like, I, I was yeah. freaking – you know, I'm commentating ABCC. I've done it two years in a row. I'm going to do the next one too. But like in 2007, on Friday night, I was laying mats out for ADCC. I had to lift tables up and down a stadium. I had to translate Portuguese. I didn't even know Portuguese. I had to do running. I had to go get lunch for Bruce Buffer. I had to tell fighters. I had to try to kick Henzo Gracie out of the thing. You have to do all the shit that no one wants to do before you get to the cool stuff. And it's just like you. Like, you had to go out there on the front lines and compete. You had to go there and slowly build your academy. So there's a lot of parallels in the industry um, as, as far as what we do, you know, but, uh, man, I appreciate you, what you're doing and, and thank you for your kind of words. Cause it's, it's been a long process. I, like I said, I've always wanted something better for jujitsu here. And that's, that's always been my little thing, you know, and I'm, I, I've kind of not positioned myself, but I always wanted to be involved in something more, whether it was bringing other events here and maybe I got shit from the local community for it. I didn't care. Cause I always saw it from a different lens i always saw it like well mm. i want to make it bigger you know so how do i look where do i how do i make things bigger well i want to be involved with the bigger things out there and try to help those things get here and then expand you know and that way everyone expands so mm -hmm. that's always been my driving force is just number one just growing the sport growing the people in it and that way i know that i'm doing my service and kind of paying it back in life, if you want to say it or whatever, you know what I mean? But that's, that's kind of how I did it, you know? Yeah. Cool. Now, um, how, yeah. how did you start in BJJ? How did that, like, what's your, you know, how did you get introduced to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? So, uh, my dad was a Gojuru karate instructor oh, okay. and he used to teach. Yeah. So he used to teach Gojuru at the high, at the university here, McMaster university cool. in Hamilton. So, and you know, when I grew up, I was always like, see pictures of my dad, you know, in karate, like freaking bare knuckle days, you know, like where you could actually grab the gi and just bah, bah, you know, the old school karate gojuru. So when I, when I grew up, I was always like looking at my dad as like this martial arts guy, but he was never really into martial arts by the time I kind of got to a time where I could train martial arts. He showed me a few things here and there, but in my head, I had a seed. You know, my dad did martial arts. I wanted to do it. He never, you know, had a big academy. He taught at McMaster for a while. And then he kind of did other, you know, jobs and stuff. But that's all, you know, that's what stuck out of my head was like, well, my dad's a karate guy. You know what I mean? So it's like a superhero. So I wanted to yeah. be that too. So 
I started doing martial arts uh, preteen, and um, I did karate, and it was kind of cool. And then I saw like Bruce Lee, and I was like, "Shit, I gotta do Wing Chun." Jiku no, I couldn't find any JKD schools here, and there was a Wing Chun school, but it was weird. And then I was like, "Whatever." So then I went to Joslin's for karate, and uh, I started doing karate there because I was like. There's no Jiku no, there's no Wing Chun. I'm 17 years old. I only have a bus pass. I didn't have a car. I was like, <laughs> yeah. that's all I got. I got to work with what I got. So I went to Jawsons, started doing karate. So then uh, at Jawsons, uh, that's when they started to introduce the, 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 the grappling and the UFC and stuff like that. And, and that's when it all came out. So then I was like, all right, cool. Grappling. Because when they started, it was not a jiu-jitsu program. It, it was official. grappling. Because, yeah. No, because... No one knew what jujitsu was back then, you yeah, know, like yeah. we knew what it was, but like no one had access to it. So what did we do? Yeah. We went, you know, Jeff was uh, the main instructor. And there was a couple other guys at the time that were like his assistant instructors, uh, this guy named George Capenius, uh, Joe Karachi. So they started a grappling program. And what they would do is we would go to seminars with the Gracie brothers, yep. learn, and then bring that back. Yep. Then we would get judo books, you know, read it, learn, bring it back. Wrestling books, learn, bring it back. Sambo books, learn, that bring it back. Sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah, sounds familiar. Right? And then exactly, and then and then uh, uh, VHS tapes came out. Oh shit! So we started to get the instructions. Yep. First one was uh, Pedro Carvalho, Henzo Gracie, yep. Greg Kuko. Yep. Yep. You know, like we all did. And that's yep. the funny thing is, is people don't realize is that nowadays every gym has different curriculums back in the day if i went to your gym you know shaw franco back in the day in 96 yep. or 97 yep. and i said 96, uh you know show me show me americana from side control or mount we both spoke the same language because we only had the same resources there was yes. only these 50 moves we were allowed to learn at the time so everyone had the same you know uh uh yep instructionals everyone had the same stuff i still remember the day you were like man i just got this new vhs tape mundial 1999 you brought it to a tournament you showed me holeta and amari patech you're like i still can't understand this shit but that was the thing we all had the same resources right yeah then, pretty much you know turn that tournament it was a, started much, coming it was to a much simpler game it was a much simpler yeah. fundamental game uh you know yeah. and it, it, it now of course it's gone insane but I think we only we all had the same resources and it was like a very similar game and everybody was kind of doing the same things. So yeah, yeah, and reason. it was like we all had the same bases, but then like we would see like every you know the guy who had like one little trick. Oh shit, this yeah. guy went to Henzo Gracie's in New York, you yeah, know, Bocek or whatever. Yeah. Oh man, I heard this guy's neighbor was Brazilian. Now all of a sudden he had some cool new trick, you know what I mean? Or, or we all like one. There was always one new thing, and then oh man, this guy's a judo black belt, and he started to do the grappling tournaments. Like the guys from Samurai, we we're like, man, they know takedowns. I didn't know any takedowns back then. I didn't know what a takedown was until like I don't know ninety eight or something. You know what I mean? So it was cool. You know, we all yeah, we all kind of learned the same. We had these crazy tournaments back in the day where you oh, know yeah. the rules were everything would, allowed. <laughs> yeah, I still remember the poster of the, the 96 Canadian Jiu-Jitsu Open. It said, uh, 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 gi, no gi, shoes allowed, headgear allowed, uh, hair pulling allowed, you could choke with the belt, heel hooks allowed, reaping, yeah. that wasn't even a thing back then, you know what I mean? So yeah. that stuff was like, people, if they saw that today, they'd be like, what? They would be yeah. freaking out. they think it was like, the UFC or something, you know what I mean? It was it was different it was times wrong, back man. then, but it was fun. It was wrong. It, it was, was raw. Very it was raw. <laughs> it was raw. Yeah. But we you know it was lucky. cool. We're, yep. We were we were we were fortunate, like you said, but it was cool because through the beginning we got to live through the evolution of the sport. We got to yeah. live through the technical evolution and the sport of tournament industry, how that evolved as well. So we got to oh, we yeah, got to time. Right? We got to big see it on the down. front lines, you know. We we know what worked back in the hardcore days and what didn't. And we saw what techniques grew over time and we trained those techniques over time, you know, all together as, as the OGs in the community, you know. So it was it was amazing, you know. It was so, good times. Anyways, but there was there was a lot of trial and error though. Like you know, a lot of us are a little bit mangled because, you know, a lot of times, oh they we're trying this, we're trying that. I mean, I think yeah. there's definitely you know, a road that was paved and now, you know, the the newer generations like 
they, they train smarter, safer. There's more knowledge there, you know, of what to do, what not to do. There was a lot of trial and error back in the days, you know, oh, let's try this, let's yeah. try that. And then there goes your knee or there goes your ankle or, you know what I mean? That's so, it. I That's think a lot, because the OGs are we did, pretty banged up, man. <laughs> yeah, because we did if if like let's look at it this way, like if somebody had a heel hook, right? Nobody really knew how to do it the right way back then. You know, you saw like Ken Shamrock do it, or you saw like a Sambo book and you tried to yeah. do it, but could you, no one knew how to escape that yeah. back then. No, so it was yeah. like if you got caught, you were screwed. You were hurt. You got hurt. And, um, and, you know, I remember training back in the day, we were allowed heel hooks, even at white belts. Yeah. And that was like my go-to, like, if I fought like this guy that was like a bodybuilder type guy that's been training jujitsu for a while, I was like, I can't, I can't sweep the guy. I can't unlock the guy. I'm going to grab this guy's leg and he'll hook the shit out of him. And I'm going to tap him because <laughs> I didn't know any better at the time. Yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? And he didn't have any escape. So it is what it is, you know? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Man, I, I remember doing like scissor takedowns. You know, it was like yeah. one of my favorite takedowns was scissor takedown. But yeah, I remember I mean, you did that. You did that in the OSW, right? You got Sean yeah. Kreiser did the, yeah, I the went single for leg. It. I remember. I went for I remember. it. Yeah, I yeah, remember. Yeah. <laughs> I went for I it. I remember. That's yeah. it. That was a good match, and I went better than I anticipated because he had some hype behind him at the time. He had beaten like uh, everybody for the trials for the OSW trials. Right. And then he That's had right. like a, he had a really good performance against Eddie Bravo uh, in the That's US. That's right. That's right. So wow, was, I totally forgot about that. Yeah, and he he did really really well, right? So I was like, oh yeah, man. he's a, he's and he was, you know, he's pretty. He was an athletic guy. He had some skill, but it went my way. I was pretty happy. Yeah. Pretty, yeah. So. <laughs> So to answer your question originally, I, that's how I got started in jiu-jitsu. Obviously, we, we, we uh, training at Jawsons, we, we went from, you know, grappling, and then we kind of got uh, more of a jiu-jitsu program, you know. Yeah, we started yeah. to explore <laughs> stuff. We ended up going to uh, – we ended up going to Atlanta, and then that's kind of how a lot of things started yeah. on my end. So yeah. how did you start your jiu-jitsu journey, Professor? Tell me. Oh, man. Have you – I don't know. Like, I've been posting, like, for – a while now about like my martial arts journey you know and i okay. you know, how it all started and it's all over my facebook um but so when just... i remember the first time i saw you i saw you at uh there was a, a tournament sorry to cut you off it was no. like i think it was called the toronto golden cup or toronto yeah 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 <laughs> what was it, it called was... <clears throat> yeah i know what you the golden belt yeah golden belt yeah, so it was a karate belt. tournament that allowed grappling in yeah. one division. And there was no beginner, intermediate, advanced. It was just weight class. You know, I had yeah. Chris Ellerton and the Sambo guy from Samurai. And then I remember you rolled up and you had like Taekwondo pants or something because you were doing the karate. You were doing the karate yeah. tournament. And I was like, oh, who's this guy? And then shit. I was like, oh, man, he can grapple. He's with Monkey and those guys. But anyways, let, let go ahead. That I remember that. I did really well until I, I got, I think, to the final. Or semi-final, and I ran into Mark Bocek. <laughs> it, didn't, <laughs> it didn't. It didn't go well for me, man. <laughs> man yeah. You know, I, I I fought. I competed against Mark three times, and all three times he he beat me up. Mm. He was good. Oh man, man that's yeah, yeah. Mark was. Mark was. You know, man. I we we have to call a spade a spade. <laughs> I think that Mark was, um, pretty much our benchmark. Yeah. At that time. At that right? time, he was the best. He at that time, guy. at that time, he's yeah. the best Canadian yeah. uh, jiu-jitsu guy representing, you know, and, and going out and competing. He was the first guy, I think, to really go uh, for an extensive period in Brazil. Brazil, yeah. For an extensive and, and all that stuff. So, yeah, I mean, it's yeah. no, you know, no shame in that, man. But go ahead. So I, I started to – I'll keep it short because I think a lot sure. of guys – a lot of people on here already know the story a little bit. But, but there's some – started but there's some – because it's joined – but, yeah, sorry okay. to interrupt. Because it's joy, though, there's new people from my end that are yeah. listening and they yeah. want to know about you. So go ahead. So I started in, uh, with Taekwondo at 17. And then I went, to, I, you know, I didn't like the whole point sparring thing. I was not a fan of it. And the whole kata thing yeah. was okay. But because that's all we were doing, that's what I was into, right? But then I was like, I still wasn't quite feeling right about it, right? But then uh, a gentleman started teaching Muay Thai. His name was uh, Sam Liaoui. Uh, a European champion. He started teaching Muay Thai after 
like the Taekwondo class in the same building. So I'm like, wow, this is more, this is more my flavor because, you know, it was full contact and I can spar and not have to worry about a speed game, which was karate was a speed game is whoever touched the other guy first. Yeah. So I, didn't really, I yeah, I didn't like the tag thing. Um, I, I did okay, but nothing special. And then yeah. got into Muay Thai. I did that, I think, for about four years, four or five years or so. But as I was, like, doing Taekwondo, I was doing both. I was doing Taekwondo and Muay Thai at the same time because I wanted to get my black, finish my black belt in Taekwondo and then move on. Sure. <clears throat> but nine, like everybody else, man, 1993, November 12th, <laughs> right? UFC won. Uh, I, I used to, I was a fanatic. I used to buy every magazine and I used to, like, every martial arts magazine I would buy. And then there was, of course, advertisement for UFC 1. I'm like, cool. And then me and my buddy ended up at, like, some Italian bar. There was, like, nobody there. And the guy put on the fight. So we watched UFC oh, wow. 1. So we watched UFC 1. I'm like, wow, what the hell is this? This is amazing. I want to do what that little Brazilian guy is doing. And being yeah. Portuguese and having, like, uh, and being in a community that was, like, Portuguese, Brazilian, I was like, this is really cool. I want, like, I want to do that. Of course, no BJJ in Canada at the time. So the, the best thing that I could do, that I could find, I was lucky enough that within like really close proximity to my house, there was a community center and they had a judo program. So I started doing judo because that was the closest thing that I could find to jiu-jitsu. And I did that for a bit. Um, I did a few judo tournaments. I went to the AMCAMs in, in Rochester. I came in second there. I did okay, like in, for the lower ranks, I did all right. Uh, but then uh, that's where I met Monkey was there he was at this judo club the trinity bellwoods nice. uh, judo club and then uh he's like oh then we became really good friends and then he's like oh there's a there's a karate guy up the street that's bringing a brazilian uh for some seminars and that was shaw franco with his uh, oh, okay. with his with his karate school up on bathurst there so i went with monkey and then that's when he got introduced to shaw and silvio master silvio and that's where you know the journey started it was around 1990 seven ninety eight but from ninety three until ninety seven ninety eight I was doing like there was already grappling tournaments the c g a was running yeah. tournaments, and I was competing in those, and again, with like little to no experience, right, but I did okay, I was doing all right um and then I remember meeting Shaw actually prior to that in ninety six at a the when the the when Higgin and Carlos Machado came up for seminars. And he yep. was there, and that's where I originally met him. I remember meeting him there, um, and uh, it was it was kind of funny because they had a little in-house tournament, right? And I was pretty young at the time, still like early twenties, and I ended up going to the final, and I did a flying armbar, like a helicopter armbar from guard. Yeah, and that's how I won the match. Of course, Carlos and Higgin, like they're all they're like loving it because it was. You know, was, I did nice. really well with that. And then Shaw was like, we spoke afterwards and he, they were giving me props for that, right? And then when I saw him two years later, I, I was like, oh, you, it's you. So I was like, cool. Like, we already had kind of like a, a connection before. And then, man, mm -hmm. after that is history, you know? Then uh, all the all these amazing guys came over and started training with us. You know, Justin Bruckman, Sean Pearson, Antonio Carvalho. These are guys like that made it to the UFC and... Uh, and a whole bunch of people came through that place in and out, you know. So it, it became like a bit of a MMA, BJJ powerhouse back in those days. And I remember there was like always three, like three clubs that it was always battling out. So Jocelyn's, uh, us, uh, Franco Baring, and then the, and um, the Karma Boys, right? Yeah. Um, but then, you know, then other people started coming in. So Wagner came in. So Novo Nyan started to get a pretty big pump as well. And then it started to just go, go, go. And next thing you know, like <laughs> all these years later, I'm still at it. But uh, yeah, that I just basically from 96 on, we were like with the, the Franco Bering team with Masters mm -hmm. Sylvia Bering and Shaw Franco. And it was good times, man. Just really fun, fun times. I, I really enjoy those. I miss those days daily yeah you know you remember and you're like oh i wish you could go back but you know father time is merciless <laughs> <laughs> i remember um i remember being at, i remember going to like a uh, silvio seminar at grappling arts because remember uh yeah dan and so used to have grappling they, arts and then they used to be they, with us they used to be with silvio yeah yeah so Origi i remember originally. uh 
Yeah, and I remember <laughs> uh, going to that seminar, and that was pretty interesting because that was the first time that I feel like I got, um, how do I say it? Like, I felt like, okay, remember we were talking about back in the day that everyone shared the same knowledge, okay? Yeah. So everyone had, like, the Gracie basics. So we went to a Henzo seminar at Grappling Arts, and it was awesome, awesome. But it was all stuff that he showed. That's right. Remember Pat yeah. Kuligan was there, and Henzo yeah. sparred with Pat, elevated him, we were like, oh, shit. And we made us do, like, part of the seminar was, okay, somebody, who's a good boxer? And that guy, Marius, was there. And he oh, made yeah. us do, like, sparring, <laughs> like, you know, takedowns against, against the punches. I was like, whoa. But anyways, uh, after, outside of that, I feel like, um, like a lot of what Henzo showed was also on his VHS tapes. So it was like, okay, it's cool because it's Henzo and we could ask was, him anything. And he was, was, very, he was amazing. It was very MMA-centered. Exactly, MMA exactly. Yeah. But but when Silvio came, I remember, I still remember, like, he was showing, like, the next level of, like, okay, like, this is the introductory to jiu-jitsu. Here's the second step. So here is how, mm -hmm. for example, if the guy is going to pull guard on you, how to defend it. I was like, whoa, you could do that? Like, I had no <laughs> idea, you know what I mean? And then he was showing other stuff, and, like, and he was pretty cool. He was like, what about this? Did Hedzo show you guys that? And people were like, yeah, okay, I'll show you this way. And then it was like, so that was when I was like, my my, my head started open. I was like, oh, so there's other people yeah. outside of the Gracie family that does this shit, you know? <laughs> and then that kind of opened stuff up for me a little bit, you know? Yeah. Now, it, it, we were very fortunate because as far as like where Matt Cecilia was in his career at the time, he was still like, in, I think in his mid thirties, so he was still very active. He was still able yeah. to roll with us and beat us up. He was like at the time where he was building the, those guys, you know, Mario Hayes, Marcio Corletta, Fabrizio Fordun. Like he had a bunch of really solid guys at the time that he was like building in Brazil. Guys who ended up being world champions. So he was very, very like competition centered uh, still yeah. at the time. Um, but he he was also very uh, strict about us learning the, the self-defense aspect of it. Yeah. So we, we, like, I know all of the self-defense that, you know, the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu self-defense. But you got to keep in mind, Master Silvio came from, like, his father was one of Helio Gracie's students. His masters, the, the Barreto brothers, were very heavily involved with the Gracie family, and they were instructors for the Gracie Academy. So he's got yep. Hicks, Hickson and his brother, um, Marcelo, were, like, best of friends. So he has a really deep rooted like system that comes from the Gracie family. So yeah, he's, he was a very knowledgeable guy, but at the time he was very like still into competition and teaching us competition methods. And we lucked out, we lucked out because it worked out really, really well for us. And we were very fortunate as well. Like we always had like for the next few years, there was always like either a purple belt training with us from Brazil or, a brown belt. Yeah. We had a lot of visitors <clears throat> because of the location of the city. Whenever anybody visited Toronto, they would go to us originally, you know. So we had a very fortunate yeah. to train with a lot of good guys that even if they were just visiting from Brazil, they would pop in there and we'd pick up a few things and learn a few things. So that was that was really cool. <laughs> and that yeah. was awesome. Man. I remember that like just in that time in general, you know, um it was so like it was just so different because anyone that like anyone that came to Canada to teach seminar, you know, I would see Yugu or Monkey or Omar or we would all like like yeah. little you know all, like little, I don't know <laughs> I was like little mice on a piece of cheese. Everyone would shh and just go try to get that information because it was so valuable at that time, you know. And it was like you know it, it was it was it was cool to see. We would see each other at seminars and then we were so and then like, the super hungry for knowledge because we didn't have the yeah. same access that no there's no youtube no internet no nothing so like we were no. very every little little piece of information we were trying to get so it was and, yeah, and then i remember the seminars the seminars too were also like you know oh man like if i would go to grappling arts there guy i'd be like oh man i'm gonna roll with these guys and like 
see yeah. like how you know oh shit they're doing yeah, this yeah. technique i've never even seen that before like what yeah. so we would experiment with our techniques and share knowledge it was a lot of different time you know i think we yeah. were yeah. it was a little more open back then you know and it's kind of come full circle again i think people are a little bit more um open with their academy doors to a degree but uh it was it was definitely different times back then for uh, sure i still i ha- you know like my, my open mat is one of the biggest ones in the city uh on sunday oh, okay cool it's and that's the day i say i always make sure i make everybody understand like this and this one day a week the lines are blurred right and everybody's welcome it's a community open mat it's for everybody nice. and you you know forget the patches forget the teams just come and it's about jiu jitsu right as long as you of course you know come with a good attitude and good behavior and just yeah. man it's it's always busy it's packed lots of people come from all all different teams but we still have some teams that are like no nope, you know you don't go there don't go anywhere just stay that's <laughs> fine and that's okay too there's nothing wrong with that if that's what you yeah. i mean as long the thing is like if that's if you're going to do that that's fine as long as you provide your students with you know, enough uh, of an environment. Like, okay, if your open mat is huge, then, okay, you don't have, you don't need to come to mine. But if you come from a small academy and you don't al- don't allow your students to expose themselves to, you know, once in a while to better training, then, you know, I think you're, you're short-sighted, right? So, yeah. But yeah, I, I really, I, I, but it's only once a week. You know, you know how competitive I am. You know, after that, it's, it's back to lines are drawn again. And uh, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay. Um, how, second question. How did you get into the whole commentating thing? Like, how did that come about? Oh, okay. So it kind of goes back to um, what I was saying before. Remember, like, I always wanted to um, bring something else here. You know, I always mm-hmm. felt like, the Canadian scene was awesome and I loved it, but I always felt like I wanted to do something to bring events from outside here. So what happened was in 2009, um, Fabio Holanda said, you know, he let me know. He's like, you know, we were, we were good friends at the time. And I was already remember promoting some small events like the OSW, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Uh, and, and Fabio started to do the trials and I had fight, you know, I had my business and I was like, first he asked me to sponsor it. Just a reminder, guys, I was the actual first fight store <laughs> in Canada ever. Actually, one of the most well-known fight stores worldwide, but we'll get to that in another subject. But anyways, uh, <laughs> and I sold the business in 2012, one of the lucky ones. So um, now uh, I sponsored the event. First, he's like, hey, you want to sponsor it? He's like, man, why don't you help me with the event a little bit? So I was like, sure. So I started to like help a little bit, like, you know, uh, promoting it and trying to get, you know, organizing it and stuff like that. And then what happened was in 2009, uh, Fabio went to Abu Dhabi for the, for the actual World Pro. And then he got the tapes back from Abu Dhabi TV of the finals. So he brought the tapes back. And then he said to me, he's like, Balea, can you, do you know anywhere we could put this on TV? Because the Sheik really wants to get on TV yeah. all over the world. So I was like, man, I, I know the guys at Fight Network. I'll talk to them. So I mm-hmm. talked to the guys at Fight Network. They were like, yeah, we'd love to, you know. So they put it on. But then they were like, we don't have anyone to commentate, you know. Like uh, they had, you know, John Ramdeen kind of knew jiu-jitsu a little bit at the time. Robin Black, I don't even think he, you know, like he still doesn't really know jiu-jitsu. But sorry. But, um, <laughs> you know, so it's like – so at that time they were like, you know, Hey, um, why don't you commentate? So I did it and I was like, Oh sweet. So I was like, you know, I made so many errors and I remember, I still remember messaging uh, showdown Joe after. And I was like, Hey, uh, you know, what, what did I do? Right. What did I do wrong? And he gave me some pointers on that. And then I was like, it was really cool. So then from there, um, I started to get a couple more requests to do commentating. So I think the first one was, uh, grapplers quest. Yeah, it was Grappers Quest. So my friend, um, uh, the guy Brian Simmons from Grappers Quest was like, hey, you know, I saw that you did commentating because you put it on social media. Why don't you come to, um, I think it was Vegas. He's like, we're going to have the UFC Fan Expo. I was like, whoa. Yeah, so they yeah, brought me to Vegas. Like, yeah. It was huge. Was, you know? It was so pretty I, I cool when they came here too. I thought that was a great event. It was yeah. really well. Yeah. 
And it's sad. Like we had a few events like that, and they I thought they did really well, and then now we have nothing. We used to have like uh, MMA expos and stuff like that. Now it's just like, yeah, it's disappointing. It, yeah, it, it's. I have my opinion on that, but it's it's a whole other subject for another yeah, day. But yeah. anyways, we'll um. So the, the at the end of the day, so I started to commentate. You know, I did the grapplers quest, and then my friend uh, uh, Rob Constance, they call him Black Rob from Henzo Gracie. He ran an event called the Ultimate Absolute in 2010. So he uh, invited me to commentate for a mutual friend, so I commentated that. And then it just kind of, like, kept snowballing, you know what I mean? Like, and then I got another gig at, at, at Grapper's Quest. And then in 2013, Copa Podio, uh, I was talking to him about something, and then he asked me, he's like, hey, would you come to Brazil? And I was like, go to Brazil to commentate jiu-jitsu? This is insane. So I went to Brazil. <laughs> You know, and then I, I did that there. And then, you know, uh, 2015, uh, I started to do some work with Flow Grappling to commentate their events. And then it just, again, you know, I got hired to do, you know, events all over the world. You know, Finland, Abu Dhabi, Argentina, Brazil, uh, you know, you name it. So that's kind of how I got started, you know. and mm -hmm. But, again, it all came from a uh, passion of trying to build something here. And I think that that's, it's important. I never, I, I'll be honest with you. I never thought I would be commentating as regularly as I did. I never mm -hmm. thought people would like me as a commentator. I still don't know if people do. I get really good feedback and it's, I get some shitty feedback, but I take it all with a grain of salt yeah. and I, I learn from it. You know what I mean? And I never really thought I would do it. Honestly, like I, I never thought it would be my thing. But then when I started to get into a rhythm and I started to see my mistakes, fix them. And then I was like, wow, this felt natural. Then I was like, okay, I want to do this. So then I started to put myself out there a little bit more. I started to kind of promote myself as commentating. And then, the, the you know, in reality, as we all know, with social media, it's like, you know, the what do they say? The baby that doesn't cry doesn't get fed, you know? Yeah. So yeah, if you yeah, don't yeah. put yourself out there, if you don't let people right. know you can do a job, no one's going to hire you. You could be the best thing, you know, person in the world that doing something but if no one if you don't put it on monster.com if that's a thing anymore oh, people aren't going to see your resume you know what i mean yeah. they're not going to come to your door so that's what i started to do i was like oh yeah i'm commentating here i'm commentating there then other promoters started to see it and then other companies started to see it and then asked me and then through that whole process i was like you know kind of involved in the events as well like a little bit like i was trying to help grapplers quest here i, I tried yeah, to help yeah. with five grappling here and i tried to yeah. I, my, my, again it all goes back to my thing i just wanted to kind of grow things here and uh that was my biggest thing i felt like if i could help grow the sport i could i could do something good for jiu-jitsu and people um and, and that's kind of how i did it and the commentating thing was always like secondary it was always something that kind of fell into place but now i kind of feel like Maybe that's what I was supposed to do, you know? Like that's yeah, yeah. Well, it's you definitely I mean? your primary thing now, right? Well, <laughs> it's it's well. I mean, it's it's probably my primary thing that I'm known for. But I do right. a lot of stuff behind the scenes, um, you know, as far as some events are concerned around the world. I don't want to get too much into that, but I do a lot more behind the scenes stuff than people know about. But I'm more involved with a lot more stuff than I am just with commentating. But yeah, I think commentating is where people kind of see the visibility of my yeah. work a, a lot more, for sure. Well, with flow grappling being such a predominant uh, uh, fixture in the BJJ community nowadays, and you being a prevalent part of that, like, it's putting you out there a lot, right? So, because, I mean, I, that's what I see from you most of the time is what you've been doing with them. And they're huge, yeah. right? I mean they're a big entity right now. And so it's good for you. It's good exposure. It's building your brand. And um, I see you're venturing more and more into your own little thing right now because of the COVID. So you're doing a lot more of the YouTube and the interviews. And so, yeah, man, it's good. But is it safe to say this, like this is your main means of income or do you have another job? Uh, right now, um, <clears throat> my main income is, is primarily through jujitsu. I have a couple side things that I do. But, okay. you know, I was teaching classes, uh, I was doing privates, I was doing some work with flow, um, you know, a lot of that kind of combined. So I, I wear many different hats, you know what I mean? As, as a, I've always been like yeah, that, but, I've always been but somebody. Within the, but within jiu-jitsu, right? It's, so it's jiu-jitsu, jiu yeah. Jiu-jitsu is how you're, you know, how you make your income. Yep, 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 yeah. right now. Okay. Yep. Now, I'm going to 
put you on the spot a little bit. I hope you don't mind. Sure. Nothing too serious. Um, just, I mean, I know that you, you've been heavily involved abroad and with all these big events and having amazing interviews with all these incredible people. And you know a lot about uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and the big players in the game. But how come we don't really see you too much on the local scene? Like, uh, be honest, I don't really be see you at you. the tournaments. I don't yeah. really see you interacting with a lot of the local talent. Like, just curious about that. Sure. So I'll be honest with you. I have three kids. And um, for me to, you know, I have a four-year-old, a seven-year-old, and a 10-year-old. For me to drive to Toronto for a day, I've tried to go there and bring my kids. It's it's tough. It's It's rough, right? I'm not an academy owner, so I – don't have like a team that I can go there to coach right from time to time. I'll pop in and I've tried to bring my family, but it's, it's harder than it looks, especially if you don't have a vested interest as, as an Academy owner, as a coach. That being said, um, this last year, I, you know, I've been kind of chatting with a lot of the promoters behind the scenes, you know, just giving my input. Um, you know, like I said, like I wear diff many different hats and I'm saying, you know, here's here. I see this on the outside here's some tips that I think you could work with. And um, I was actually, because I started to create content now for flow and myself, I actually spoke to Fernando and I was like, I'll tear you open. I'll be there. I'll be filming. First time I've ever done it, filming a tournament, but I'm going to come, good. I'm going to film the Ontario open. I'm going to do interviews with the, you know, the big winners, uh, make a highlight video and start nice. funneling that, you know, into the kind of like the more mainstream. So I, I know what you're saying. And I've, I've heard, you know, I've heard, uh, I've had people message me and say like, Hey, how come you don't do more locally? But again, man, it's like, you know, you know what it's like as, as a father, you know, it, it's, it's tough sometimes, yeah, yeah, you know, and yeah. unless like, imagine you didn't have your team and somebody said to you, like, why don't you just show up at the tournaments with your family? It's like, I live in Hamilton. I'm an hour away from Toronto. That's where all the tournaments are. I'm not making excuses, I, I'm, but I'm, I'm you have kids, you understand. Dude, I know, but I, I'm from, like, a different kind of thing. You know me, man. Like, I, I'm a huge supporter of the events, the tournaments. I think it's important. Sure. Uh, and then my wife is extremely understanding. She knows, you know, that it's important to me. Yeah. So I don't know if it would be much different whether or not I had Academy or not. I still think I'd be – because I just love competition. I love watching the tournaments. And I'm a big – Yeah. Yeah, man, you've known me for a while. I, I believe in supporting the local scene. I believe in supporting for sure. the talent. I, I, I think we have a lot of talented people and they deserve more exposure. And you know what I mean? And um, no, I, I'm not trying to cause any issue here, but I, you, you've, it's, you're almost in a way where, dude, you made it. You made it to a point where you're influential, right? And you, I think you made it to a point where you could help the local scene a little bit more. That's okay. you know what I'm saying. So because sure. you're, you're, you're there now, you, you're at this point where you kind of made it to a global uh, uh, where everybody knows you in the BJJ community, right? And you can, you know, you can give back a little bit, I guess, in a way. But uh, that's amazing to hear about you and wor working with Fernando. Man, that guy's a workhorse. <laughs> you know, yeah. he, he's a workhorse. And uh, it's, no doubt he's the, he's, the Ontario Open is the biggest, largest, Mm -hmm. every year in Canada and I, I'm glad to hear that and I look forward to seeing you out there and doing your thing I think it'll be great I think it'll be awesome yeah I just started I just started filming um I never filmed before but I just started to do some stuff like obviously like my my own stuff on YouTube I filmed the highlight for PJ's Academy uh, yeah. um it's nothing special nice. but I think something is better than nothing and I think um the 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 one thing that I can contribute the most with is trying to help the promoters um, understanding, you know, what, how to kind of get the visibility in the grand sp scope of jujitsu. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm totally down to do that. I've always been down to do that. Yeah. As far as physically being at a tournament, there's, I don't know what that helps per se, but I feel like I can help in different ways. So maybe it's, we're on the same page here, but I can mm -hmm. do it in different ways. Right. And, um, you know, yeah, I, I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm totally down to do that. And, nice. you know, I've worked so hard to kind of, you know, work kind of with other events all over the world. And um, it's not like I'm like neglecting or forgetting and I want to kind of build you guys up. Happy to do it. And like I said, that's kind of why I spoke mm -hmm. to Fernando and, you know, trying nice. to work with 
with him, and then we'll see what happens. If that goes good, if, he, if I can do something good and other tournaments here want um, or they see value in having me there as a, mm-hmm. uh, a filmmaker or, or content right. creator, then I'll do it, you know. But That's I don't want to do it just – I don't want to – like, I don't – it's hard to explain. Like, you know, like I said, when you have a wife and kids, mm-hmm. like I create, I do content all week. Right. So for me to go just to do it as an experiment, it's tough. Right. But I want to do it and do my best ability show that I'm, I can do more. And then if other people want that, I'll do it. Right. If it yeah. doesn't come out good, I'll see, I'll, I'll, I'll try to find another path for me to kind of do things locally. Mm-hmm. But like I said, I, I think like more than like me, um, working in the local scene, I think that there's a lot of little things that we could do locally here too. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I always give the analogy that, you know, bringing people, I, and that's why I've always tried to like work with events to come here. That, that was my sort of contribution over the years. I feel right. uh, to helping with the local scene, because let me put it to your perspective. In my opinion, if it's, if we bring uh, lo- uh, guys from the outside to come here, right. And we have like a super fight or whatever. And our Canadian guys beat them or our local guys beat them. What happens? Yeah. yeah. Media from outside says, so to, whoa, yeah, what yeah. happened? Yeah. Who was the guy that beat? Let's say, I'll give you an example. Like I told Fernando, I said, Fernando, here's my advice for you in Ontario Open. Marco, at the end of this, this, you tell me what you think about this, okay? I said, Marco, I said, Fernando, you're with Cicero Costa. Okay, cool. You know the guys at Unity. Bring the Meow Brothers to the to the Ontario Open. Don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone. But just let them compete in the Ontario Open. And let them do their thing. If they win, guess what? Beautiful highlight comes out. Meow Brothers win at Ontario Open. Right? Mm-hmm. Okay? Now, if somebody goes in there and beats them, Darson yeah. Hemmings, Eric Fan, one of these new, you know, young black belt kids. That's a headline. Local Toronto Antonio kid beats Joao yeah, Miao. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At Ontario Open. Yeah. See what I'm saying? And then what? Okay, they're going to want money. Well, definitely. Book them a seminar. Yeah. You know, but, book them a seminar. You know what I mean? He's definitely in the position where he's the one that has the most pull and can do a lot of those and do a lot of that. <sighs> like for me, right. it was going to be my, it was supposed to be my first foyer into to, uh, running a tournament this year. Um, now I don't know what's going to happen or if that's even a possibility now, uh, but definitely going to foray in next year if it doesn't work out this year. But uh, I think I'm new to the game and as far as tournament running tournaments go. So I'm going to keep mine, you know, to a certain, uh, to a certain thing and then hopefully grow from there. And then, you, yeah. know, you know me, man, I'll try to make a run in Ontario open, you know, what I mean? like that's, that's, that's it. like that's my competitive it. nature, man, you know, so, but yeah. what do you think? But what do you think? What did you think about that idea? Oh, absolutely, I agree. But that's what I'm saying. Like Gringo yeah. is in that position to make those moves. You know what I mean? Definitely. Yeah. So, and he can. And every year his tournament is bigger. And but at the same time, like you can't get complacent. You gotta, you know, you gotta keep uh, evolving. And and I think you're you. It's, I think it's good advice. I think definitely think that's good advice, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Um. So we have about 10 minutes left. And I just, I'm very curious about what your opinion is on the new AJP rule set. So I your saw honest opinion. The, what do you think? I'm all for, I'm all for experimenting with new rules. Okay. I, I feel like, I feel like, we can all agree on one thing that we all disagree that there's no rule. We all agree. Let me put it again. We all agree that we can all disagree on what rule set is the best. Does mm-hmm. that make sense? None of us can say this is the best rule set. If you say AJP, five guys are going to give you reasons why no. If I say ADCC, five guys are going to say no. Mm-hmm. If you say IBGGF, five guys are going to say, oh, blah, blah, blah. So there's always things. So that's why I feel like rule set is um, okay if we experiment. I think that it's good to see different variations of rules. I personally, when I go to tournaments, I see the value in shorter matches and more dynamic matches. Speaking with some of the top black belts who have competed, I see their point 
in 10 minute matches. So, so I don't feel like we've cracked, you know, what rule set should stay and, okay. and all the other ones disregarded. Let me, let me put it so this I way. Feel, let me okay. put it this way. If, out of all the rule sets, which rule set do you believe would be the right one for the average consumer if Jiu-Jitsu went mainstream? So we're not talking about if Jiu-Jitsu aficionados or freaks like us who just love Jiu-Jitsu so much. No. How do you get just the average viewer, you put it on the sports channel, how do you get an average viewer to sit there and watch? Which rule set do you think would be the best at this point? So you, you it's a two-part question. Number one, you said for the average non-jiu-jitsu person, right? So if you want the average non-jiu-jitsu person to be in, to be watching and consuming that media, you have to create a more exciting, more dynamic rule set, which means shorter, which means um, modification of the current IBJJF rule set, in my opinion. Because I'll give you an example. I sat with the head of Red Bull Media at the IBJJF Worlds once, okay? We watched Keenan and Mushesha fight. And he was like, this is cool. Everyone's cheering. Who are these guys? I have no idea what's going on. I don't know what's going on here. So, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like, so something is missing from the current thing, yeah. right? So my point is, is I like in tournaments, shorter rule sets like Copa Podio or AJP Tour. I AJP don't like advantages. I don't like advantages because I feel like advantages – uh, but, force the fighters to stop in positions as opposed to continuing don't you like, don't to try you, to go. Don't you think that giving them that, making it a point instead of an advantage, do you, do you not think that's a, a better way to go at it? Because then it's only one scoreboard you have to worry about. And I think like, I, like I, I like to bring up the match between Low, uh, not Low, um, Keenan and Marangali. Because, come on, Marangali had like 13 advantages. Right? Almost submitted him three times. Keenan comes up, yeah. scores two points, wins the match. Like, if, yeah. if those advantages were points, it would have been a blowout. You know what I mean? So, I like yeah. the idea to make it a, one, a single point instead of, uh, uh, of the, the advantage thing. It's one scoreboard you have to worry about. You don't have to worry about seeing three things. Like, penalties, same thing. You lose a point. Like, so, I like the new AGP just because, again, it's more uh, viewer-friendly. Uh, you can understand it maybe a little bit better, shorter matches, more exciting. Uh, I like the idea of not grabbing the pants. Nobody wants to see ass crack on national television. You know what I'm saying? So just saying, I think that's a good rule set as well. So there's a lot of like good things that are going to make it more viewer friendly. And remember, uh -huh. we need to crack the mainstream. Jiu-Jitsu is not mainstream. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's going to take a while before it's getting closer to being mainstream because we have a lot of celebrities making it the new cool thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of, you know, movie stars doing it and putting yeah. it into their movies. So we're getting Netflix, closer. Netflix and the movie. They're doing the movie. Yeah, with the Hicks and movie. We'll see. But I, I like like you said, like I like the new AGP tours. I like I, I like Copa Podio. I like I like them all, to be honest with you. Like there's not yeah, many yeah. rule sets. I, that I that I could say like uh, do I think that EBI should be the only rule set? No, not, but sometimes you need no, but sometimes you need those you need something. You know what I mean? Like yeah, you, yeah. you have to do something. Like if I'm gonna see two guys but look, just but sitting there, but look, but look, it had no staying power. It's run its course. No, like, no, that but that's another subject. That's a financial subject, yeah. probably. What I'm talking about is if you see two guys drop on their ass and and grab each other's pant and then look up for advantages. That shit's not exciting for anyone. So no, you know like what? It. If that's going to happen for 10 minutes, yeah, I want to see them do a skills competition of some sort. You know what I mean? Like if that's what they want they want to do is fight like that, then why not have them do a skills shootout? You know what I mean? Like, But I, for me, my, my I love ABCC. I yeah, feel like, yeah. you know, um, I feel because it's a little more nostalgic and it's biannual, uh, I, I just enjoy it a little bit more. You know, nothing to, nothing against anyone. I, yeah. There really hasn't been too many rule sets that I don't like. I haven't seen enough AJP tour, to be honest with you, to say anything negatively. I like what I see, though, for sure. 30 seconds. Plug your stuff. 30 seconds. Go. 
Oh, thank you, uh, guys, follow me on all right. Follow me on Instagram, Ricardo Amadolia BJJ. Follow my YouTube channel, Ricardo Amadolia BJJ. I'm putting out daily content. I just had a massive interview with Gordon Ryan. Uh, sorry, with Hodger Gracie, and even Gordon Ryan asked me questions for Hodger. I got techniques. I got old school matches. Thank you so much, man. Thanks, brother. Take care. Be safe.